coming up, I play some golf. I review some games. Jeff gives us some more next. And I chat to Alan. Let's get on then. Golf games. There are many versions across multiple platforms, and so many different styles. I loved golf games, especially on the Amiga and PC. The Spectrum had a fair number too, so I'm going to check out a few and see how they compare, and see how they approach gameplay. There are surprisingly a lot of them, so we won't dwell on them too much, but we'll quickly shift through them and pick out any good titles. Slow up! Let's start from the very beginning and early titles first. Here is Spectrum Golf by r, &R Software, released in 1982. This 16k game has 9 or 18 holes, and each are generated at random. You enter a number from 0 to 12 for the direction, and 1 to 100 for strength. The direction represents the numbers on a clock face. Rather odd way of doing things, but once you get used to it, it seems to work okay. There are no club selections here, so it's just a simple game. The graphics, as you can see, are 8 pixel user definable graphics, and the movement and sound are typical of an early basic game. Next we have Golf from DKtronics in 1983, another 16K game. The difference between this and the first one is very obvious, large graphics and smooth movement. The game has 18 holes and you can select clubs too, but in a numeric sort of way, so club 0 is a wood, and 1 to 8 are irons etc, and 9 is a putter. You select a club, how strong you want to hit the ball in a percentage, and the direction, which is based on a compass, so north being 0, East being 90, West being 270, etc. Each club has a maximum distance too, so you'll need to know your clubs. If you get on the green, the view changes to give you a better view as well. Once you get used to things, it's not a bad game really. Still in 1983, and we have Golf, also known as St Andrew's Golf, by Arctic Computing, which was later re-released by Paxman. The game is 48k and provides 4 woods, 8 irons and a putter. When you start you are asked for your handicap, just pressing enter crashes the game. Entering a number lets you continue. The screen layout is very poor. A choice of wood or iron comes first, and then the strength, and then the option to hook, fade or play straight. And then comes the angle, and this time you have a small compass to help you. Playing the shot, and the line is drawn. Oh dear. I gave up on this game. The lines just confused matters, and at times I had no idea where the ball was. Still in 83, and we have Golf from Virgin, a 16k game with 18 holes. And when you load it up, you are informed that you can change the number of holes to start with by editing line 35. So I guess this is in basic then. You get a few clubs, one wood, five irons and a putter. And the instructions are informative but wrong. Here again we see the use of the compass for direction. Once we get into play, the game takes ages to prepare the hole, and ages to draw it. Ah, that looks a mess. Playing a shot and you see a tiny animated man hit the ball, and the line is drawn. However, the instructions say that 90 degrees is east. Putting in 90 degrees though, sends the ball right down to the bottom of the screen, due south. I'm struggling to like this, in fact I hate it. It looks terrible, and playing it is just a chore. Ocean entered the market in 83 as well with Royal Birkdale. The screen is a bit odd on this one. The top part shows the side view of the golfer and the crowd, and the lower section shows the top view of the course. You get a club choice, a strength choice and a direction. The golfer swings and the ball magically appears where the program calculates it will have landed. This is the first game so far though to use what is now considered the default game mechanic for golf. When you are ready to take the shot, the golfer raises the club and starts to swing. When the club is at the bottom of the swing, you press the M key to strike the ball. The closer you get, the better the shot. Not a bad game, just not great. Other entries in 1983 included Golf from Abresco, a 16k game with 9 holes and a very basic screen layout. 
It uses multiple clubs and the compass. It lacks a strength option though, so you just have to go by the club for the distance. Also golf from Liversoft. A good selection of clubs with 18 holes, shot strength and a clock option for direction. Both strength and direction are controlled by the plus and minus keys. And this is frustrating to play. I couldn't even hit the ball right. On to 1984 then, and will we see any improvement? First up is Handicap Golf from CRL. This game has 18 holes and plenty of clubs, and this is the first game where you can actually preview the hole before playing it, albeit in flip screens. The club selection method is really good, and play is easy, but there's no strength sadly, so you have to use the right club to get the right distance. The animation is good as well, and I like how the player and caddy walk off after a shot. Not bad from CRL, and there's even a close-up of the green when you get there. This is the best one so far. It's a bit slow, but certainly playable. Next is the Open from CSS. The game had multiple add-on courses, none of which ever seem to have been released. There's a good club selection and options for power and direction using the compass again. The swing and stop method is also used for hitting the ball. When you get to the green, there's a close-up, making things much easier. Not a bad game, but the top-down view is very messy. Now beyond 1984 we have Nick Faldo Plays the Open, released in 1985 by Mind Games. Now here we have a different view and different controls. The top half of the screen is a top down view of the course and the bottom half of the screen has the controls and the graphic of Nick and his caddy. Using the hand you can view the course, pick a club, set the power and set the direction. It's all very slow and cumbersome and would be much better with a mouse. Once you are happy with your selection, you can click on Nick, and if the caddy thinks you have made the wrong choice, he will ask you. You can of course override this by clicking Nick again, and the shot will be played anyway. Once played, the screen scrolls and the ball lands where, hopefully, you want it to. Apart from the controls, this is not a bad game, and things are certainly improving on the golf game front. and Pro Golf 1 and 2 from Atlantis Software in 1986. This game plays better than the others, but still uses the compass for direction. This time though it's visible on screen, and can be moved by the O and P keys. This makes it far much easier to get the right direction. Club selection is also done using O and P, as is the strength for the shot. The club swing uses the familiar two clicks, one to start the swing and one to hit the ball. Once on the green we get a close up too. Now this game looks and feels very much like an updated version of the Open. Pro Golf 2 has the Dynamite Dan music too, very interesting. Now on to Konami Golf, also in 1986, and the first game to give us a 3D view. There's a club selection, this can only be done when the direction and shot have been set. You move the pointer on the top view to select where you want to hit the ball, and then the shot type. And then when the power meter is moving, you can pick a club. After the first shot, the player is not shown again, and you have to set the direction, club and power to continue. The green has a close-up, which is easy to use, and this is a nice simple game to play, and I enjoyed this. Moving on, and the first leaderboard game was released in 1986, with a few further titles including leaderboard tournament and world class leaderboard later on. Let's look at the last release then, leaderboard tournament released in 1988. You have a choice of up to 72 holes, which gives plenty of playability, and we get a nice 3D view. 
who get a choice of the full set of clubs, and we're now moving into the game style that we all know well. Well, at least if you play golf games, that is. The shot is taken slightly differently. You hold down the fire key until you have the right power, and then release it, and then hit it again when the bar gets close to the middle point. A familiar mechanic in all modern golf games. Everything works really well, with wind and slopes taken into account, and this is really a great game. On to 1990 then, and we get finally Pro Golf Simulator from Codemasters. As you would expect, nice presentation, and here you can scroll around the course before taking the shot. Club selection is good and easy to use, and the strength meter and shot type are also easy, and the whole thing feels smooth and well thought out. The graphics are great, and this was really enjoyable to play. However, it's very easy to get confused which hole you're supposed to be playing, and I often got on the green of the wrong hole. Then I noticed the numbers next to the holes themselves, oh dear, but you still have to scroll around before starting to play. The music is a pain, but it can be switched off. Well, that was it. That was the golf games for the Spectrum. You can see how they evolved over time, moving from top-down basic drawn courses into 3D views and animated golfers. Codemasters went off and did their own thing as usual, but the game was fine to play. Right, now it's back to Lynx 2003. I didn't mean to hit it that hard. This is Cytron, released by Beyond Software in 1984. And this is a game that sold heavily on its beautiful graphics. And yes, they do look really good. But the game doesn't actually use them. Instead, the action takes place either in a small tunnel or above the Bitula 5 installation, as we shall see. Cytron is the name of the computer that handles the entire installation, from life support to defence, and in this game you become Cytron. As you start, the installation is under attack from flying saucers, floating above the buildings, and dropping down small droids into the airlock service tunnels. You have to chase them, catch them, and destroy them. To do this, you flip across all locations, and watch for small droids in the white tunnels, when you see them, you head off in pursuit. You can also hear them drop if they're on another screen, so it's a mad dash to find them when you hear that sound. At this point, you use the bottom right of the screen, which shows a 3D view of the tunnel. You chase them, flipping left or right, and then shoot them to destroy them. And you have to do this for five minutes. The initial wow of the graphics are lost as you concentrate on the small 3D tunnel window. To get to the next level, you have to reach an average score of 50%. Now, I'm not sure if this means less or more, because several times I got 60 and 65%, but it wouldn't let me get onto the next level. I tried many times too, taking a long time, and to be honest, the novelty wears off after the first 20 minutes of chasing dog-like robots down tunnels. Alas, after a long time, I never got past the first level, and never did when I bought it back in 1984. There are no RZX recordings either, so you can't watch it but there is a file you can type in that gives you access to any level. There are six levels in the game, and on the second level you get to shoot those pesky saucers. It's a bit tricky to line up as they're constantly moving, but it's a nice change from chasing endless droids down tunnels. The third level is a mix of the first two, with droids and saucers to shoot. The fourth level steps into the strategy part, and it's about repair work. You have to allocate crews to different areas based on the importance and how many crew members you have. And each area of the screen has an important purpose. For example, life support, so you may want to prioritise that over something else and put more men on that. You scroll through the damage report and allocate how many crew you need. You can flip back to the game and start shooting things again while all this happens. And remember, this is on a timer so you do have to play until the timer reaches zero. On to the fifth level then, and it's supplies. It's pretty much the same as the repair thing, except you've just got to make sure there are adequate supplies for all of the crew. And on to the last level. 
Well, the manual just says you have to keep everything running for as long as possible, and then states to win, you have to do it for one hour. To be honest, it was the graphics that sold this game. The gameplay is okay, I suppose, but a bit difficult and time-consuming, and you can soon get frustrated. I never knew the game had these strategy elements in it either, because I could never get past the first level. There are a lot of things to contend with, and a lot of different mechanics in this game. I'm not sure I'll come back to it, to be honest. It was more of a nostalgia trip, really. But still, nice graphics. This is Flappy Clive, released in 2020 by Ferrillo Productions. From the name I think you know what to expect from this game, but starting with the presentation, and the game looks and sounds really good. The game has a single key as a control method, and you use this to keep Clive flapping away as the scenery scrolls past. You have to guide him through the narrow openings and try to collect money and other bonuses as he goes. The graphics, as you can see, are nice, although the game does play in pretty much silence unless you collect something or hit something. Control is okay, but it can be tricky to get poor Clive through some of those tight openings, and he'll often smash his head on the stacks of computers. Sometimes when he's a good few pixels clear as well. A good flappy clone then, easy to play, and one to try. This is I'm in Shock, released by Arctic Computing in 1984. Here is a really interesting take on the shoot 'em up. There are groups of aliens at the top of the screen and your ship at the bottom. However, you can't just shoot them. Scattered around the screen are various triangles that act as deflectors, and that word in itself should trigger a few memories of a game from the 16 bit machines with a similar idea. You have to bounce your shots off the deflectors to clear the aliens. They do shoot back though, so you have to keep alert. The graphics are basic 8x8 pixels and move in the same 8x8 pixel jumps, but the control is a little bit too sensitive, and you often find you have to jump left and right continually to get into the square you want to before you can shoot. There's a constant buzzing sound throughout the game, and spot effects when you hit something. If you get far enough, there's a large mothership that you have to get rid of, and then a new batch of aliens appear. I like this game. It's a simple game. It's an entertaining game. It's easy to play, and a little bit of a challenge without being too frustrating. A nice little shooter, then. So when you were doing these things, did you have uh, an eye on memory because um, AGD loads into the Spectrum's memory, which reduces the amount of space you've got for a game? So how did you yes. manage? How did you manage not to just keep using up more and more memory? Oh well, that's that's actually um, something that is that Jonathan's built into AGD already. It uses a sort of paging system. So I don't know if you're aware, but the Spectrum memory is kind of split into two areas, which is contended and uncontended memory yeah so the lower part of the memory is called contended memory it means it's share it's shared with the ula chip which basically means it's slower um agd games generally are very fast and they run in uncontended memory so they don't run slowly whereas the editor is actually held in the lower half of the memory in uncontended memory what it does it copies editing code from memory banks into the contended memory right so the uncontended memory is always free so it doesn't matter how much more code you add to the editors uh you're not you're never gonna um you're never actually taking up memory that's used for the game 
the way that the memory works is that you've got the you've got the game engine below the game data, yeah. and then below that you've got the editor. There's about six k in there. Right. There are some editing routines that are that are used for everything, mm. sort of like certain messages and things. And then there's about three k, which is paged in from one to eight k. So when you're editing sprites, there'll be different code within the memory right. as to when you're editing right, yeah. blocks or as you know it's loaded in each time. In AGDX, so, I noticed that you've uh, reduced all of the uh, instructions in the code, haven't you? So you, you've, uh, I thought that was part of, of, of memory saving because you've changed. Ah, yes. Well, that's, like that's funny. Because write down and all that thing. That's right. Because, well, that, you've reminded me now because that was, that was one of the first things that we did. You probably know as a regular user of AGD that a couple of things can happen. The buffer can get full. You know, the, basically the, the editing buffer yep. of a script that you're working on. The reason we use the shorter words, basically, is because it takes up less space in the buffer. And also, with some of the code that I was writing, I was getting nested if statements that were actually going right across to the end of the screen. Mm. So that made, it, that made it narrower on the screen as well. So for those two reasons. Um, but one of the other things I did was also recode when it's, um, when it's compiling. Mm. Um, what it does is it compresses all the sprites into an area and then it compiles the code and then it recompresses the sprites to give it enough space to have the buffer to work with oh, so yeah. you may you i'm sure you've noticed in regular agd when memory starts getting low and you write a script and you press save it starts to get slower and slower but in agdx it doesn't do that anymore because i recoded it to to use the one uh, k memory more effectively so I've been looking at some of the videos and there's some really interesting things that you've added. Um, mm. You've added uh, ropes, you've added um, masked sprites, which is yeah. quite interesting. I wouldn't mind getting a, a look at that at some point. And well, most of the stuff that I did was to do with the editor, to, mm. to improve the functionality. And basically, I'm really keen to get more and more people interested in developing games, mm. you know? And if... Um, if you make it easier for people, obviously, the, you hope that would mean that more people would would get into it. So that, that's that been my main sort of area. In terms of the patches, well, you know, a lot of them are, are kind of things where I'm just playing about and I'm just doing it to learn. But a couple of things that I really liked, obviously, I don't know if you ever saw that Mario demo that I did. but Yeah, um, with, the, with the scrolling screens. Yeah, so that was that uses a buffer and it, you create the levels in, a, in in regular AGD and then it basically pushes them out in, onto the screen as you move along. And uh, it actually came out pretty well, and it works quite well. But the difficulty then is controlling the sprites because you've got the sprites still think they're only on one screen, so they don't know what's, <laughs> yeah. what screen they're on. You know, it's just, it became a bit, of a, a bit of a challenge, really. Unfortunately, and I'm, I'll be the first to admit it, you know, I'm, I, I do sometimes have a tendency to, to do the things that are, um, you know, flashy and they look nice and then then you get down to the practical reality of making them work in a game and you sort of mm. think, oh, oh, that's going to be tricky. You know, it's like demo scene. You know, people who write demos, they, 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 they make amazing flashy graphics and everything else, but ask them to put it in a game and sometimes it's, it's, it's not mm. nearly as easy, yes. is it, yeah. from, from a practical point of view. Welcome to Type In Corner, and this time we're going to look at Barrels and Ladders, written by D. Millington and released in 1983, and it can be found in Popular Computing Weekly from August 1983 as well. Now at first glance this may seem like a normal platforms and ladders game, but it has some interesting features. It's a full page of basic, and after typing it out I had a few problems that I had to debug first, but let's give it a play. The idea of the game is you have to collect the barrels and drop them at the bottom right. And to do this you have to time your movement to coincide, or to miss, the little aliens that are wandering about. This may seem easy but it's not, because the timings are very important, and the aliens are placed in such a way as to make things quite difficult for you. The 
the graphics move in character squares. Yes, it's a typing. What else are you going to expect? And the sound just consists of beeps, but the gameplay is, to be honest, not too bad. I think the most barrels I've managed to collect are about five, and then it gets pretty difficult. This game is not online anywhere, and it's probably the first time it's been seen in over 30 years. And it'll be on my website to download shortly. Enjoy. Today we're going to take a look at Next Basic. Next Basic is a huge step up from the original Spectrum Basic. People are achieving some terrific results with Next Basic just on its own. So if you want to program for the Next, there's no better place to start. And here are a few resources to help you on your way. The first, of course, is the Next Manual itself. When Paul and I asked Jim Bagley at a Play Expo a few years ago what people should do when they first get their Next, his answer was to read the manual. And this is really good advice, and it stood me in good stead. The online version is available and now has a contents page which was missing from the printed version. The strange thing is that the contents page is at the back of the PDF where you'd expect an index to be. I'd really like an index and if anyone's compiled one and has made it available please let me know. It's a great resource and goes into basic programming in a lot of detail with some really really good examples. It goes through all of the original basic commands and the new next basic commands. The next is a kind of cheat sheet. It's the next basic reference. This is available from spectrumnext.com and goes through all of the basic commands. It's very concise. It's much quicker to look through if you're wanting to troubleshoot or just find out what a certain command does and how to use it. Now we're going to look at some YouTube resources. The first of these that I'm going to mention is Daryl Sloan's. Very early in the next life, Daryl created a next basic tutorial. He not only went through the next commands, but talked about how to structure the code for a game. He also talks about using the next sprite editor, which a few of these tutorials do. This is a great place to start if you've got very little programming experience. Daryl explains things really well, he's really knowledgeable. Daryl's also written a tutorial for 8-Bit Magazine, which takes the reader through creating an arcade game. I ordered and have read the first edition of this and it's explained really well. I like the way he does it, I like the way it's written, I like the way it's laid out. You'll have to buy several of the magazines to get the full tutorial, but if you're just starting out, I think that would be well worth it. The next YouTube resource is Lee Smith's channel, Lee Smith's Workshop. Lee has done a series of four tutorials talking about the sprite commands on the Spectrum Next in Next Basic. Lee does a great job in these videos explaining the different sprite functions available on the Spectrum Next. He goes through Sprite Continue, Sprite At, Sprite Pause, Relative Sprite, Sprite Over, then in his final video explaining the Spectrum Next tile map. Lee goes into a lot of details on all of the different functions in BASIC as he goes. He also makes the code available in the notes for the videos which is a great bonus. If I'm going to level a criticism at Lee he does go through some of the detail quite quickly. But if you're using the functions he describes, this is a great resource to get a good appreciation of those functions. And you can always look at the code itself in detail after watching the video. Next are uh, Jim Bagley's tutorials. I'm sure if you're up with the Next community, you'll have noticed that Jim Bagley is doing a series of tutorials, code along with baggers. He's actually doing these because it was a stretch goal for the original Spectrum Next Kickstarter. They can be found on Jim's YouTube channel. All the videos are recordings of live streams Jim has done on Sunday afternoon, where he describes the basic concepts of working with binary numbers, then looks at coding in both BASIC and Z80 Assembler. They're much longer and ambitious than the previous YouTube videos I've mentioned, although as they are live streams, there are sections where Jim's helping people follow along or debug their code live, or debug his own code live, so sometimes the tutorials can slow down, but that's what YouTube times two speeds for. If you want to learn Next Basic, if you start at the beginning of these and follow them through, you'll get a really good understanding. One thing I would say is that I'd suggest you follow through Daryl and Lee's tutorials first. This will give you a bit of background and help you understand what Jim's doing. Although Jim does explain it, I think it's worth doing the tutorials in that order. Probably Daryl's, then Lee's, then Jim's. 
What's great about these tutorials is Jim doesn't just go into next basic, he goes into the underlying theory behind it. He talks about binary, hexadecimal, uses C Spect and other PC Next tools. He also gives you good advice, such as pressing F10 key in C Spect changes between keys in game and basic mode. Jim also shows how to use the Next Sprite editor, not just to create sprites, but actually as a kind of hexadecimal editor to create tile maps that can be loaded into basic programs. If you only follow one tutorial, you should follow this one. But as I say, looking at the others first will give you a bit of a head start and is a great background before you start on this tutorial. So that's basic programming on the Spectrum Next. If you haven't had a go, if you've only played a few games or you're wondering what to do in your, with your next, if you got it out and played with it for a little bit and think what, what on earth will I do next, then I'd thoroughly advise you have a look at some of these tutorials, have a read of your manual, download some of the resources, download the next basic commands and give it a go. You never know, you might produce something groundbreaking.